Dear Professor Alzoli von Weizsäcker, it is our third afternoon of the future, about the future, and in 2019 the focus was on quality innovations. In 2020 on the new enlightenment, and today on the feedback loops. The debate was very lively after your keynote by the next generations, by the students particularly. What is your perspective to get all generations in the boat for a good future? I suppose that grandparents find it easy to sympathize with the offspring. And I have the enormous privilege living in a house with three generations. I'm the old one together with my wife and one of our daughters and her husband and three kids. And I totally sympathize with them. So my question will be, it's always nowadays a tremendous challenge to maintain a good present. For sustainable development, we always speak about the future. So how can we engage a real pace towards future without leaving it aside when something urgent today appears? Excellent question. I mean, we have a sort of widespread disease in our civilization which reduces everything to the ne next 20 seconds. This is the result of the Twitter communication. The Twitterer find anything that is older than one minute completely irrelevant. That is a madness. So we have to relearn what I absolutely naturally learned when I was a boy. I was not in this obsession with now, 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 now. That's a result of the so-called social media. Um, and once you begin to look into questions like climate with a time range of 30 years or so, or if you think of education meant to make you strong, for the next 40 or 50 years or so, then the problem is easy to solve. You simply think it's not now, it is eternity. And that brings us to the core here, education, our responsibility. And I have the feeling school kids, for example, in Germany, it might be even more in France, it's, it's full of content, 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 content. And the, the passion in German, the Muse, uh, to let things um, settle, understand, feel. What is your um, notion for education? Education so far has been mostly reduced to what you can check and control because of the grades that you get for what is uh, measured to be exactly correct. That, however, in my life experience, is the wrong approach. We need a kind of education that allows you to consider different possibilities instead of just the right answer. The mathematization of all education and of all publications is, I believe, a civilizational mistake. We better learn to have a more holistic picture instead of a microscopic picture. But today, quality in science is measured by the number of publications in peer-reviewed publications 
in peer-reviewed journals, which essentially are reducing the reality to tiny little microscopic, microscopic facts. And that's a wrong concept of education. How can we move on? That because uh, it seems to be like a bureaucracy that regulates education, say for example in Germany. Uh, we don't want to wait, young people don't want to wait 10, 20, 30 years. How to get the momentum in to, to change for a good education future on a wide scale? Let me first begin with something I learned in Scandinavia. In Scandinavia, they have a new movement called European Bildung. And one of the initiators of that, I asked, why don't you say education? She, oh, no, no, it's the opposite. Mm. It's not education, it is Bildung. It's broader. It's what uh, relates to the way of thinking of Immanuel Kant, not of some small-scale mathematician. So we shouldn't invent the wheel again. We could look at Scandinavia and then from there to adopt, improve, cooperate together. Yes. Perfect. And how can we manage to go from education into actions? That is always very useful. It's a test. If you have learned something, try to prove you have understood it by doing. Is really important to um, give the best into small actions taken by people, or do you think that the change come from either governments or the firms, or that relies completely on society? There are different roles. Parents' law, a parent's role is essentially helping children to grow up. Business people's task is essentially to make money for the for paying the employees and uh, to the shareholders. The state is essentially in, um, obliged to look for a good framing so that you cannot become rich by doing cheating, by doing destructive things, but you make money by something that is good for um, many people and for the future. We believe in science, education and science. And um, so the scientific the knowledge and the wisdom, how can it be conveyed to the students that they can feel it, for example, how, well, how much you can achieve with a kilowatt? Well, in physics, in biology, you can have experimental portions of your education where the pupils are supposed to really handle things. And, for instance, to observe how a caterpillar becomes a chrysalis and then a butterfly. Right. The fantastic change inside one individual. And if you have sort of practical experience with caterpillars, you will see that transformation can be a good thing. And in physics, you can learn correct measurement of light, of distance, of power. All this can be measured. And the advantage of good science is you learn correct non-cheating measurement. 
The trouble is that if you only look for non-cheating, it can be boring. You also have to open your mind to surprises, to communicative um, successes, to gifts to friends, etc. Those are not something for measurement, but something for a good holistic um, understanding of humans. Right. Today you told us about feedbacks and uh, you told us about um, relevant lie or inconvenient truth. And it's for sure um, more reassuring to have a lie that we understand than to accept the inconvenient truth. How can we change that? The famous book by the then Vice President of the USA, Al Gore, An Inconvenient Truth, was meant to tell people how dangerous it is if global warming goes on and on and on and on. But it is inconvenient because it is Convenient just to do the old uh, habits continuously. So it is uncomfortable to look into the truth. And I showed a caricature, a cartoon of a cinema with the film of Al Gore, An Inconvenient Truth, and Uh, the rival of it, a reassuring lie, and you saw everybody uh, walking to the reassuring lie because it is so fabulously convenient. People live in a living space in cities and they are on a big scale like Paris or Barcelona or London. There are good examples on how, for example, Streets are being um, restructured into pedestrian areas. Kids can play on the street again, meet with their grandparents, go out, go to um, have perhaps neighbor gardens and so on. This truth of to have a better quality of life that you feel, are there not many promises that if people feel quality growth, quality improvement, that we get them on the boat? Absolutely. I mean, if you're living in a village, it is somewhat easier because you know so many of your neighbors and you can trust them. And that is a wonderful situation for learning. Learning by doing. Also, learning by friendship. In the large cities, you are confronted in many countries with um, criminality, with criminals, not allowing children just to play outside. Mm. And in that case, you will have to have the kindergarten uh, sh um, protected area. You have the family, you have friends whom you can visit and maybe a garden which is more or less um, also protected against a potential uh, criminal. And then, of course, you have the police helping cities to uh, avoid too much uh, negative happenings. But cities are restructured. So yeah. basically getting the car out, cars out, and making green spaces, good living spaces. And so this, um, this harsh tendency politically as well, you know, this is good, this is bad, this is right, wrong, zero, one. Um, to let people feel the improvement in quality and get them on the boat, to, to get passion by feeling and not having the inconvenient truth to say, well, it's easy. So is there optimism that 
we can get the society um, on a large scale on this uh, journey towards quality? Yes, there are examples of chiefly smaller um, villages and towns where you are simply happy to walk on the street, to meet people, etc. But currently the um, need for high-rise buildings because of lack of space um, produce the opposite, mm. where people don't even know the, peop uh, the other guys in the next um, uh, uh, well, floor. Right. So the modern ob urbanization, which is part of the result of an extremely fast growing world population right. is more or less destructive to the kind of positive experiences that you are referring to. Right. And towards this, um, how can we make people accept to have a more resilient life, a more degrowth life, instead of a more too much growth and too much wellness and too much self being. I suppose that everybody would love to have a resilient um, civilization in which the neighborhood, the friendships, etc., are flourishing. The trouble is that in our economized um, world, our anthropology of money-making, the priority is shifted. First make money and then enjoy, and not the other way around. So I believe that the anthropology of homo economicus is bad for culture, bad for civilization, bad for families, bad for peace. So today um, we have covered the dimensions um, time, space, so a global activity, um, and quantity, yeah, so the, the, this, this hunt for growth and quantity. The new generations, Friday for Futures, um, Greta Thunberg and all the young pupils, uh, can we feel the pulse of a change? Yes, they certainly have a concrete political goal, which is a stable climate. And they know that this race for economic success is destructive for climate. And therefore they protest. And I think they are right. On the other hand, there is the constructive need to establish infrastructures, technologies, habits, um, cities and villages, etc., which are resilient and joyful without maximizing the money turnout, right. turnover. We also like, talk a lot of the next generation. How can I personally, or all of my friends, engage with our parents' generation, or our grandparents' generation? That's a very good question. My observation is that grandparents and their grandchildren get along very easy, while between parents and children there is always an element of 
ambition of um, correctness, of success, and all that, where the parents tell the children, you have to work hard to become a real successful citizen, etc. That causes clashes. And I believe a good civilization is one in which these clashes are um, reduced and cooperative um, habits uh, become dominant. Crossing the countries, here we are international university. We um, allow our students without um, losing a semester to go abroad, part of their studies. Cecil is here in Furtwangen uh, for her double master on mobile systems. Now, um, th this activity, for example, in Germany and France concerning energy, here we have got lighthouse projects like Hamburg, the hydrogen harbor, which will have a big impact on production on the industry in France, the nuclear movement, it's still considered to be green, CO2, or Bill Gates is proposing s small nuclear power stations. So in Germany, we're, we're almost, most people are almost shocked about that. How can we cope with that? How we can we convince um, Europe as, a, as a, a, a peace project and a collaborative and friendship project to, to address uh, peacefully the future of energy? Essentially, I see two answers. One is the development over the last 10 or 20 years of renewable energies becoming competitive and now even more competitive than nuclear and more competitive than coal. Yeah, exactly. So um, the switch to climate-friendly energy becomes a common experience for both France and Germany. And the second is um, reducing the demand for energy by better energy efficiency. Right. But that will not happen unless you give a sufficient price. The current mood of um, digitalization, of bitcoins, of, um, how do you call that? And the blockchain base that you put yeah, contracts yeah. digitally and distribute them. Yeah. Mean, right. the, the entire digitalization makes for a lot additional demand for energy. Right. Which is always neglected. But it's a brutal fact. The streaming, video streamings, and yeah, so massively, exactly. this and all of that. Streaming. Yes. Right. yes. Uh, it should get a price, yes, yes. a price per um, megabits, a substantive right. price. I mean, for milk and energy and space, we pay a price, but not for bits. Not for that, right as if this is a free good. It is not. This brings me to a, a last question from my side. The bits. I have had the opportunity to be in Davos at the World Economic Forum in 2020. And the quantum computer, Google and uh, IBM, they um, presented their research on the quantum computer. So quantum physics. What can we learn from quantum physics? I can't answer. I believe 
the quantum computer essentially allows you statistically to play and thereby win efficiency. But what that will lead to in terms of everyday life, I cannot predict. It's in the stars, it's in the, our future. Perhaps Cecile, exactly. you like to from the next generations? I like to, yeah. Finish up, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I like to be part of the hope for the future, for sure. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Vielen Dank. Thank you. Thank you. Hans Ulrich von Weizsäcker.